Okay, looks like we have most of you all in the room. So thank you again. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and get started. And I would like to say, uh, my name is Monet Ihanato. For those of you who have not met me or are confused how to pronounce the last name, um, welcome to the NEMSYS V3 implementation call. Today is November the 8th, 2023. We would just like to offer a reminder to those of you who have not already done so, please update your name with your affiliation uh, in the participation list so that we can give you the appropriate credit for your participation on the call today. These calls are recorded and are shared on the NEMSIS website and the YouTube channel. <clears throat> Please feel free to share this information with your team or other EMS stakeholders or review it at a later time as needed. We encourage your participation and you are welcome to come off mute or to use the chat feature to ask questions or to bring up uh, other topics. We will review all the chat information during our post-meeting debrief. Let's go ahead and get started today with um, an introduction. I'm gonna go ahead and show you this agenda here. We're gonna go ahead and get started with a stakeholder introduction. I'm going to turn some time over to our newest member of the NEMSYS TAC team, which is Mr. John Britt, for that stakeholder uh, information. So um, why do we do stakeholder introduction? Well, it's to get to know others on the call and to build connections that lead to collaboration and to have fun. So um, this person was asked, what do you like to do to relax or unwind? Do they like to try new recipes? Um, do yoga, go for walks, bike ride. Something interesting, they've been to 38 and a half states, and I'll let um, her explain that. I had to ask because it, it was interesting to me as well. What does she like best about her job? I love this answer. So e each EMS record tells a story, and I like the challenge of turning that into quantifiable metrics. Spoken like a true, um, sh shall I say, epidemiologist? We'll see. Maybe that's a hint. Any guesses? Anybody? So let me introduce Ms. Mara Nakahata. She's an epidemiologist with the Emergency Medical Services Program, uh, Health Emergency Preparedness and Response Administration in Washington, D.C. So welcome, Mara. So glad you're here. Um, I also have the um, honor of um, announcing that four new states have joined the Go Green, have gone green with 3.5.0 data. That's Montana, Arkansas, Hawaii, and Indiana. They are the 28th through 31st states to go green. So congratulations to those four states. And with that, I will turn it back over to Monet. Okay, can you hear me all today? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, perfect, thank you. And now I can hear you. I apologize for that technical difficulty. All right, Jan, thank you so much. Take it away uh, for the maintenance update. Um, you, we, we did do the maintenance update and John just finished the introduction. So we are on to the next item. Okay, perfect. And that would also be you for the 351 revision changes. Yes. So I am going to share my screen. Here we go. And we are down to just a few. So I want to um, make sure that everyone knows um, we're getting there. We're getting close. We just have a few more that we have to talk about. I know everyone loves talking about these, um, but there's just a few that came in right in that mid range. They weren't overwhelmingly no's, they weren't overwhelmingly yeses. And some of them that you said might need a little bit more work. So um, one of these down here, you'll see in yellow, the Office of EMS and uh, Jeremy Kinsman is actually doing some review on the Richmond agitation sedation scale before we move forward on that one. So that one's at the bottom. Um, I'm hoping to get through all of the peach ones today. Um, I know with our new setup, uh, thanks to Zoom bombers and, and people who have interrupted our meeting, you will need to raise your hand and then we can allow you to unmute. 
Um, you may put things into the chat. I really encourage you to speak up and and have a voice. If there's anything you see in these suggestions that either should or should not um, go forward for any reason um, as we're talking about them, because this is we're getting down to the wire, right? So this is when this needs to be um, decided, not after you know everything gets developed and we realize there was an issue. So please don't be afraid to speak up. Let us know. Let us hear what you're thinking. The first one we're going to talk about here is this one, which is e-disposition e 30 a request. It was to update the Schematron rules. Um, the national, and let me be very specific on that. This is for the national Schematron, um, where currently we have warnings set up for when you transport a patient that require you to put in the time you arrive, the destination, transfer of care, um, you know, those kinds of things. And a request was made to also put warnings and require that information if the uh, disposition was, and let's show you that, um, transported by another EMS unit with a member of this crew. So what that what the request is basically saying is if they've marked transport by another EMS unit with a member of this crew, that unit that did not transport the patient is responsible for all of the same information that the unit who did transport the patient would be for. Um, we had quite a good discussion during the annual meeting um, about this and how it could paint, sometimes paint um, the crews into corners for satisfying information that they really don't know. Um, it has been mentioned a few times that what if they think they went to a specific destination, but they were diverted from that destination and the other unit wasn't aware of that. Um, so there's a few uh, issue, uh, issues that have been brought up. Um, are there any other comments, any other concerns? Um, right now, it looks like this might be something that's best driven state to state, depending on what they need to know within their states. Um, comments, concerns? Hands raised? Watching. Hey, I'm not seeing any chat and I'm not seeing any, oh, uh, Samantha Helgi. Can you unmute Sam? I think so. Can you hear me? Yep. There you are. All right. Great. Um, I, I just would like to second your your final thought there of, you know, this is probably something better state to state. Uh, yeah, I, I worry about everything you mentioned as a, a problem um, because if they're not transporting, so many things change and they just might not have that information and they don't want to paint them into a corner. So. That, that is my my final vote for please don't do this at a national level. <laughs> Thanks, Sam. And then Jay from Wyoming, I think removing the destination arrive times would be from the scheme trying to be appropriate. It should be the unit transporting that has that information. Um, so it does sound like I haven't heard anything that disagrees with not moving that change forward. And, you know, if I don't make notes, y'all have worked with me long enough, got to write it down. Okay, the next one is eHistory 17. We did talk about this quite a bit at the annual meeting as well. And we were mostly the issue was around the verbiage. So it looks like what's been um, brought forward as the final um, version to come out with is for eHistory 17, which for those of you who don't know, it's the alcohol and bystander, uh, uh, I'm sorry, alcohol or drug use. Let's show you what that looks like. Okay. And these are the indicators. And what has been talked about is adding bystander family report drug use and adding another one, bystander family report alcohol use. By keeping them separate, we we are kind of following the same standard as our is already in there and allows you to be um differentiate between alcohol and drug use. Um, are there any issues with this wording? And I'll look for chat, I'll look for hands, I'll give you about 30 seconds to... Thank 
Thanks, Jay. Jay says it looks great. So we will go ahead and I will mark moving forward. Uh, Karen Jacobson, South Dakota. Could we also separate these into separate values? Could we also separate these into physical exam indicate suspected outcome? So that would be a, another suggestion. That would be another change. Um, we can definitely get that submitted for the next version. Um, but that would have to go all back through the process, talk with folks um, and get that moving forward. Um, so I'm looking for anything and I don't see any other hands. All right, so let's go to the next one which is an optional element to reflect the times of scheduled transport. So this is a request that was made to actually add a new optional E times element so that it could be recorded if the information is available for the time agreed upon between the EMS agency and the uh, facility that they're going to, right? So I called up, I'm from uh, nursing home A and I called the ambulance service and said, can you be here at noon? They said, yes. So noon would be what is in there. And that allows you to, to look and see when they showed up at one or when they showed up at three. I don't know that CAD is gonna have that information. I haven't found anyone that says that is recorded in their CAD, um, but I haven't talked to every CAD. Obviously, you know, there's, there's lots and lots of them. Um, this may need some more work before we could include this in version 351. I think this might need to get pushed to the next version only because it it there was a lot of discussion at the annual meeting um, and it really was almost a 50-50 split between whether people thought it would be a good idea or not a good idea or something that they could have. Um, so are there any thoughts about moving this to the next version? Is there anyone who thinks, nope, we need it right now or can it wait? And David Saylor, you should be able to unmute. David, can you unmute now? Oh, and then I think he disappeared. Hang on one sec, guys. And Jay says, if it needs to be soon, it could become a custom element. That is true. David, can you try unmuting yourself? I know you had your hand up earlier. Uh, he still can't unmute. All right, try one more time, David, or, um, is it, or can you put it into the chat? I'm not sure why we can't get him to, I mean, okay. So we'll come back to that one and um, wait and hear what David's uh, comment was on that. So let me make that so I know. Okay, so the eLabs 03, um, one of the things I'd like to see if anybody has any heartburn over removing the one that was considered to be a duplicate, which is 3403123. I know I'm gonna say it wrong, creatinine phosphokinase, 
duplicates creatinine kinase, CK, that they're the same test. Are there any issues with removing the 3403123, the CPK? Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna go ahead with the removal. Um, oh, David, can you go ahead and try now to unmute yourself? Can you hear me? We can. So this was back on talking about the, the optional time. Okay. Yeah, so I think it might be intended to address the ambiguity of the dispatch time, unit notified by dispatch. And then I'm wondering if that's the proposed change is not going to go far enough there where you know, the you know, unit notified by dispatch, the, they agree on a time the day before and they're trying to substitute this element for that time. And if, I think it could get into some confusing situations. So you wouldn't have any issue with moving this to the next version so we could look at it some more before development. Yes. Okay. I didn't hear anything in in that was against that. So um, all right, so let's go back to the labs one. Um, so we're going to remove the duplicate. And then there is a very long list um, on here that has been uh, between a vendor submission and also there was another um, submission by a, another EMS stakeholder. And some of these seem to be um, repetitive. So we were going to have them reviewed and see um, which ones are unique and which ones may help in there um, that those additions may move to the next version as well. Removing the duplication will definitely happen. Um, we just need to make sure that any labs that we add moving forward are not duplicative of what's already there as well. Um, so the next one is consider adding two new elements for stroke type and value. Um, this was talked about uh, separating out the stroke section um, for the, from e-vitals, kind of the way cardiac arrest is. That is a major change. Um, we did talk about adding a integer value for the um, assessments that actually come away with a score so that you could put in a score beyond the um, uh, positive, negative, inconclusive. So that that moved forward, but this was actually about, and so this is gonna have to move to um, the next major version change. Um, pulling it out completely would be a major change. Um, so I wanted to make sure that you knew this was not ignored. I'm not sure who the original requester was on that one. And, and at any time, if anyone has any comments, remember, just raise your hand. We'll unmute you. I think we've got it down now, so it won't be as hard as it was for poor David. And um, or and or put into the chat. Peter, I saw that you said have not had this come up in our state. The CAD piece is a box of hair. Um, yeah, the, the CAD piece makes it whether or not CAD has that information, integrations with CAD. And then you have all of those services that don't have CAD either. Um, so... Adding the next one on the list is 718, uh, adding preferred patient language to patient section. So uh, we talked about this quite a bit at the annual meeting. And part of the concern was, well, this is something the EMS clinician would have to fill out. And that's not necessarily true. It would be an element that could actually work in conjunction with the health information exchange, right? Or the patient lookups. Uh, if they have that information in there, it could be populated into that field. Just having that field within the standard does not mean that the crew has to fill it out. It would be an optional or a recommended field um, so that it has a placeholder in there. It would not be required in any way. Um, are there concerns with adding it and moving this forward? Are there um, are there 
does anybody want to say no, that that element should not be there? And again, I'll give about 30 seconds for hands to get raised, comments to be typed. And I believe this also is one that brings us into alignment with some of the other data sets that are out there. Uh, David Saylor says, should it allow multiple selection? Um, that's a good question. It's preferred language. Um, so I'm not sure about the multiple selection. Are there any other thoughts on that, whether it should be a, a zero to one versus zero to many? Jen, it's Josh Legler. I was just thinking I'll try to see if it's in uh, USCDI and what's recommended there, but I don't have that info yet. Yeah, I do think this is one of the ones that came from USCDI first, but it was not the only place that it came from. It came, uh, there was a couple of requests for it. So I will put that in our, in the notes there. Um, e other 05, E other 06, we did talk a little bit about this on the last V3 implementation call. Um, and we talked a lot about this at the annual meeting, and you've heard this on other discussions. So this was about whether or not we should be tracking the violence against EMS clinicians um, within the EMS standard um, E other 05, E other 06. And that it seems to be that the way this is trending, that's that this is going to be tracked in another system rather than adding it to the EPCR itself. Um, so I think we can close this request. And then as the violence against EMS clinicians starts to move forward, it, maybe it'll come up again. Um, but I think it's going to be uh, more of a, a, a let's see. Uh, Rick Spoth says, I would say it depends on the use of this data. If the use is to collect stats as to what type of, oh, sorry, that was for the preferred language. Uh, if it is used to collect stats as to what type of interpreters are needed, then I would say it should allow multiple selections. That's a good thought. So I want to give everyone a moment to type a, um, in regards to the violence against EMS clinicians item. Are there, are there any problems with closing this request? Remember, it can always be reopened for a later version. David Saylor says, regarding violence, yes, the scope of the EPCR makes it hard to document violence, which may happen outside of an EMS call. That's another big part of it. Okay, and then this is one that we've talked about quite a bit, which is the e-disposition 31. Oh, Jay from Wyoming says, I have some hesitancy tracking this in a disparate system. I think it should be included in those values. Jay, did you want to come off? Did you want to unmute and and talk more about that? Yeah, I'm just going to briefly say that you know, we're getting a lot of different registries and stuff out there, whether it be CARES, trauma, and all this kind of stuff, and additional tracking systems. And I think it would be good to keep this in one single place. Yes, there is that issue of, yeah, did they uh, become injured from violence and something in a non-call scenario? And maybe we'll have to address a value for that at some point in the future. But uh, I would like to get... Uh, that recorded right in, in uh, uh, when they're doing the report and get that in there. Now, I will say we track that for a number of years in Wyoming uh, back on paper, but I would sure like to see it become a, a, a much more, how should we say, uh, quality system so we could get some better data out there with you uh, smart people at NEMSIS. Thank you. Pat or Lance, did you want to unmute and talk more about it? 
Yeah, I can unmute as well. Yeah. So I, this is Chad from Kansas and I, I agree with Jay. I mean, the, right now we're talking specifically about patient records or call records and, and we, we need to have a way to track violence that occurs on calls. Absolutely. This does not allow us the ability to track EMS violence that occurs outside of calls um, in other situations we're at the gas station or whatever, but we definitely need to be able to track it as it relates to calls. And I think that um, not all EMS violence, especially stuff that occurs on calls, gets reported um, to law enforcement and doesn't go down that path. And so I think having them added into this area um, gives us a, a lot better picture and at least something that we can try and begin tracking and pulling some data on. And, and I have found we require this area in V35, we require that they answer whether there was an EMS, uh, uh, you know, injury, illness, um, or death, suspected exposure, whatever. We require that. And if they hit yes, then they got to tell us what type. And and we're actually kind of amazed at some of the stuff that we've started getting back that we don't even know that all of it's reported to their agency, uh, but it definitely has given us a lot better picture since we've moved to 3.5. Um, but having violence in here would be a great, uh, great addition to it. So do you think just having a line item here in E other 06 for violence with, would give you the ability to track it? Um, I know there's been just, I, I, there's been a lot of talk about this one. Um, I almost don't know how much we could get into version 351. It seems like there's still a lot of talk that has to be done around this. Um, if anyone at, uh, at NHTSA OEMS or or any of the, um, I think we have a few of the advisory board folks here. We've had lots of conversation about what can be tracked, what we need to know, um, how NEMSIS can work with a, a separate system, um, those kinds of things, how it could work in the future. And I just want to make sure that um, everyone is heard that wants to be. Yeah. Heard. Yeah. It would be great if there was, I mean, the challenge is it'd be great if there was a standard that works with other systems and can come here. You know, the challenge is when you look at stuff that's there already, right. Injury, lifting back musculoskeletal. That's, that's specific. I got an injury while lifting of my back or something other musculoskeletal, but then injury other. And so the challenge is, you know, how, how detailed do you get in the options available versus the things like injury other? Because I can tell you in our system, if they put injury other um, or if anything that says other, then we require them to tell us in the next question what other is. And in that capacity, you get so many different variations uh, of what people are typing in and nothing matches up. And so you know, I think globally, there's a larger issue with this of really trying to define, um, you know, what should be actual options versus what could be listed as other. But I think that's a whole nother, another topic and task. For the, the, the current case, I kind of agree with what Jay just put, you know, if there's violence physical and uh, violence verbal, um, and then maybe violence other, that would at least get us something right now um, to have in place. And then it can be a, a further discussion as you were talking about, Jen, with how do we align with other databases that are out there? How can we clean it up so that it matches others and makes more sense? Okay, so I'm going to put this into the still needs more discussion category. Um, we're gonna we're gonna make this one yellow, um, and then if there are any thoughts or any comments or or anything like that, please feel free to submit them. Not just in the chat here, but if you want to email them or if you're uncomfortable um, unmuting and speaking, please let us know. Um, we want your voice to be heard. So um, we'll have to put this one into the needs more discussion category. Um, let's go ahead and move to E disposition 31. This was the patient elopement. We did those um, uh, scenarios last time. I did send those out to the billing stakeholders group that we have um, and ask them to let 
us know if there were any concerns with placing patient elopement here in the reason for refusal and release and, and, you know, being able to show that you started transport when they um, eloped during the transport itself or at the destination. And I didn't get any responses from the, from the billers, um, from those inquiries. If there's any billers on the phone that would like to express some, some concerns that they have about the placement of patient elopement, we definitely welcome it. Um, we do not want to do anything that could uh, jeopardize reimbursement, um, but we still want the the states and the EMS provider agencies to be able to note when a patient elopes during the call. Okay, so um, hearing none or getting none, um, obviously, again, if uh, you think of something uh, in the middle of the night tonight and you email it to us, please let us know. Uh, this sounds like we have got this one um, figured out for the, oh, I got one message, for patient elopement. Uh, David, is that comment for the violence in EMS or is that comment for patient elopement? Could apply to either. Okay. Um, is there a concern with patient elopement in the e-disposition 31? I wish this was like uh, you're texting where you'd get little bubbles when people were typing. Um, having a chance for more people to weigh in instead of just who is here. That's actually a really good comment. So this has been brought forth on the um, surveys, the polls during the annual meeting, B3 calls, the DMC calls. Um, definitely the B3 calls are not the only place that these changes are discussed. Um, so they they it's definitely a wider audience than just the folks that are here today. And all of those comments and concerns are taken into consideration. Um, and this gets revised just a little bit every time it gets um, brought forth in front of you, trying to focus it more and get down to where we could actually have the, the change that we want to um, get into the next version. Okay, so I'm going to skip these four here that aren't highlighted really quick because I'd like to go down to the e-dispatch 01 item, which is adding values to e-dispatch 01 dispatch reason. Um, these are the two that were voted on and approved between the polls, the surveys, the annual meeting um, discussions that we've had. I wanted to give you another chance to talk about the hanging, strangulation, asphyxiation, and intoxicated subject. And then these two were um, part of ProQA and to keep in that harmonization, um, EMS requested by law enforcement and active shooter. And remember, these are going to be added to the drop downs. So some places that have a CAD integration may get this information directly from their CAD. And sometimes it will be selected by the crews, um, either in the drop down radio button, however you have it set up in your vendor product. Um, are there any concerns with these four items being added to e-dispatch 01? Giving everyone a chance to type in the chat if they need it. Sam says they make sense to me. Thanks, Sam. All right, so we will go ahead and 
All right, now we can come back up here. Um, one of the items that was asked to be added was an element to capture the um, ISS score, which is the injury severity score. That is not something that the EMS clinicians would complete. It would be in the E outcome section, kind of like the hospital diagnosis, emergency room diagnosis, um, those elements. That's where this uh, would go. And it is for, it would come from the ER records. It could be utilized by trauma registries. It could be utilized by the uh, 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 Surgeons College, I apologize, uh, traffic data. This is information that could be important, but again, this is not that EMS clinicians would necessarily complete this. This is something that would come from the ER record. If you have all the information within your EPCR, you could, you know, auto calculate it. It's definitely not a score. You're going to have EMS clinicians coming up with in the field off the top of their head. Um, and Jay says, I like the IAS. ISS in the outcome section, it would go with interoperability. It absolutely does. Yep. So uh, are there any objections to adding this as an optional or recommended field? Again, it would be in the e-outcome section. Jen, this is Josh Legler. I just wanted to note that this would probably come from trauma registries. So it would just be for severely injured trauma patients. Um, the trauma registry is where they're figuring out the AIS scores of the injured body regions, and then that's what what feeds uh, into the ISS. I don't know if it would be available in any uh, like uh, electronic medical records, but it uh, would be in trauma registries. Thanks, Josh. There we go. All right. So um, I don't see any other comments and no hands went up. So we can go ahead and move on to the next one, which is E disposition 19, final patient acuity, um, change element name and clarify definition. Um, so let's pull that up for everyone to see. And if my, I'm hoping that my screen is big enough for everyone to, to read, I did increase the size of it. Um, so if anyone's having any issues with the size, please let me know. So this is e disposition 19 currently called final patient acuity with the de definition of the acuity of the patient's condition after EMS care. The suggestion is to change title to acuity upon EMS release of patient and change the definition to reflect the new title the acuity of the patient's condition after EMS release of patient. This allows the element to be completed whether or not you transport a patient, um, but once you've made patient contact and, and cared for or made um, any type of interaction with the patient. Um, are the, and these, uh, the title and the definition come from the discussions between the surveys, the polls, the, the uh, last V3 meeting, a DMC meeting, um, and the annual meeting. So these uh, were arrived at from those suggestions. Are there, David Saylor asked, can they release if the patient refused care? Will the EMS release the patient? They didn't keep them. So they were, they were released. Are there any thoughts about, are there any um, other thoughts about David asking, can they release if the patient refused care? Please feel free to raise your hand or type in the chat. Hey, Jen, it's Josh again. Um... I try not to chime in too much with opinions on these because I want to hear everyone else's. But while people are thinking, um, I do kind of like the initial and final uh, of you know the two data elements where we're saying, hey, what was their acuity when we first saw them and what was their acuity when we were done with them? And uh, I don't know, maybe some wording changes could be made, but I think that's the gist of those two elements. It's like, what was their acuity when we started and what was it when we finished? Um, yeah. So I don't know. And I think yeah. 
where the um I actually think that's where the the request came from because uh the EMS clinicians in the field were saying, well, I don't know what the final patient acuity was, right? They were, and that comes from literally interpret interpreting the the title of final patient acuity. Um the definition always said the acuity of the patient's condition after EMS care. Um and so I think that's where the request came from. Was was that? Um, are there other other folks that think we should just not change the um, the change got approved during the surveys and polls we were working on the on the wording, but that certainly doesn't mean that we can't you know keep final patient acuity if if people think that there should not be a change to this element that might move it out of this one and move it into the next version. Um, but we might have enough time to, to continue that kind of discussion. Uh, Kevin Putman from Michigan, keep the title and reword the definition. Karen Jacobson, agree with Josh. David Saylor says start of encounter slash end of encounter. Uh, Rick Spoff makes sense to be start and end of encounter easier for crews to understand. I guess if nothing else, the definitions could be updated to indicate the, you know, the the beginning of this EMS encounter and the end of this EMS encounter, right? Because it's not even uh, if you handed the patient off to another EMS unit. What you're really recording is what was their acuity at the time you handed them off, not not at the t not when all EMS uh, care was finished. Um, so something like that could be improved in the definitions. Uh, Karen Jacobson says yes. Update the definition with encounter wording. Peter Geiser of Oregon sent a big thumbs up. Uh, Rick says, crews do not read the definitions. They generally make assumptions based upon what the title of the data element is. Uh, Steve C. from Macrologic, most crews in the field don't see definitions, they see the title. So it sounds like on this one, we need to have some more um, conversations. Uh, it needs more work. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm. We we're almost there. We have two more. So I think what we'll do is we will put this one um, on our needs more work, and it will be revisited again, right? Um, and then hopefully we'll be able to um, just get through these last two. You will hear about this again on the next V3 implementation call, but we will be down to just those items that we weren't able to resolve or come to a conclusion where there were no comments or concerns brought up. Um, so the this next one is for um, ticket 723, add a way to indicate when the procedure and medication was done by someone on scene, but not on unit. There was a lot of conversation about this at the annual meeting. Um, the survey and the polls were all very, um, they weren't in huge support. They weren't hugely against. I don't know um, that there was sway in one direction or another. But I would like to say this: the overwhelming comment that was made is that this is duplicative of E-Medications 10 and E-Procedures 10, where the role type of person administering the medication is listed. Um, and so in e-medications 10, which is the same as e-procedures 10, right? You, you've got the same role. So I'm only going to show you one, um, has the list of the role or type of person administering the medication. So even if they're on scene with you at the same time, you can still note that they are a paramedic. You can still note that they're an other healthcare professional that shows that they were not somebody that was on your crew because you may not have their crew ID. Um, the person that administered um, you know, would not be listed quite the same way. Uh, so those those were the oops, those were the overwhelming comments that were made. Um, so it sounds from everything that has been read and discussed, and again, DMC meetings, annual meetings, V um, three calls, surveys and polls, that um, it, it felt like the most people did not feel this was something that was necessary. 
Um, so bringing this to you, is there any heartburn with not moving this forward, closing this item? So this would not add the new medication, uh, new procedure uh, that would allow them to mark when it's on scene. And David Saylor has his hand up. You should be able to unmute, David. Yeah, it worked. Yay. Okay, so, yeah, so I think there is a lot of value in being able to document that um, uh, billing for one aspect because you know, we didn't give the medication, but we want it to be documented that they got the medication. But if it goes out in a record that, you know, the only marker that we have right now is prior to this EMS unit's care, which uh, leaves some cases outside. So if it's outside this unit's care, then we know that it was, or then you can say that, you know, we're not going to bill for this procedure, this medication and whatnot. Uh, and you know, being able to say who did it is, it probably is, is better from a clinical standpoint. So was it done by um, you know, the helicopter crew that came in to pick up the patient or something like that. Um, you, you could argue that the EPCR should stop at some point, but you know, they can still, especially with the new tr dispositions where you know, the, the crew can ride, your crews can intermingle with the new dispositions. I think there's definitely room to be able to document something like this uh, and and have it um, you know, not be considered this unit's responsibility or uh, that they're going to bill for it, so something like that. Thanks, David. Um, uh, Jay from Wyoming says he feels um, there's adequate capability on medication administration um, in the current setup with how it is. Bill Clark from Colorado we have some agencies that are both documenting on the same call, and this would be very helpful for us to distinguish which agency it was under. So the request, the original request was to mirror, so it wouldn't be exactly this, but it would mirror this element where it would be medication administered by another EMS unit on scene at the same time, right? Something along those lines. That's not necessarily what the wording would be. Um, and that it would, but it would be set up this way where it's a no, yes, this medication was done by someone else that was on the scene that was EMS. That's that's the request. Um, so there seems to be some state report. Um, David, are there other states out there that would like to comment as well or vendors that would like to comment? Uh, Karn Jacobson, South Dakota, is a request to have an option at e-medication 09, medication crew ID with a text value of not a crew member. Uh, the request was actually to do it so they could note it as yes or no, that it was done by another unit at the same time. Um, Karn, your suggestion would be another way that it could possibly be done. Um, yes, and Karen says correct. <laughs> um, so it sounds like this is another one that may need some more discussion, some more thought. Um, so we're going to put that into the yellow and the needs more work. And we can talk more about those, um, on, on calls. Uh, so the last one is for E situation 07 chief complaint anatomic location and E situation 08 chief complaint organ system. Updating the definition um, regarding the EMS clinician impression or symptom and not the patient stated chief complaint. Um, the current definitions, um, the current, I'm sorry, for E situation 07, the current definition says the primary anatomic location of the chief complaint as identified by EMS personnel. So the concern was the chief complaint is from the patient, the EMS personnel it does the impression. Um, so there was concern that the definition was kind of um, not staying consistent. Uh, for E-Situation 08, the def uh, definition is primary organ system of the patient injured or medically affected. Um, so that is not ambiguous. That just says, like, what organ system did this happen to? Uh, so for E-Situation 07, 
the suggestion is to change the definition to the primary anatomic location of the chief complaint. And then for E situation 08, it would be the primary organ system of the chief complaint. Are there any concerns about moving forward with those two changes? And again, these definitions came from discussions, um, survey, poll comments, uh, V3, annual meeting, DMC calls, those kinds of things. So please raise your hand, put it into the chat. I'll give everybody just a couple more uh, seconds to type into the chat. I don't see any hands being raised um, on the participant list. Uh, Jay from Wyoming, I may have missed something, but I feel this is the provider's interpretation versus what the patient states. So the primary, uh, let's pull this up actually might be helpful sometimes. There we go. So currently this is what's there. It's the chief complaint anatomic location. Um, and it then it says identified by the EMS personnel. Um, the patient may say they have a toothache when they are having a cardiac event. Are there are there other folks that want to raise their hand or put into chat? And thank you, Jay. Thank you, Jay, for for taking the time to type it in and put the information out there so that we can all see it. And that's a really good point. And Jay says, suggestion, change chief complaint to impression, just a thought. So if we change the definition to say the primary anatomic location of the impression, then the title of it doesn't uh, meet with the definition of it. So I think it's trying to keep that consistent with the, the title and definition. And Jay says, we can beat the title into submission. <laughs> so let's, what we'll do, because um, I want to be able to give back time for everybody else on this wonderful call today, um, is let's put this one into the same category here. Let's talk about it more on the next um, call. And, you know, send in your thoughts, send in so that it can be included. We do want to hear your opinions. Um, especially if you're too shy to speak up on the call, raise your hand or put into chat. And again, I just want to give a great big thank you to everyone who took the time to comment or or chat. I know everyone um, loves to talk about these changes as much as we do. But if we don't get your EMS stakeholder input up front, this is where it becomes a problem after it goes out into development and, and you're, you have to live with it for a while until we can get it changed. So please keep your comments coming. Please um Keep going. And I am going to turn it right back over to you, Monet. Thank you for giving me so much time today. Yes, thank you so much, Dan. We appreciate all of that wonderful discussion. Give me one second here. Okay, we're going to look at this agenda once more. And uh, Again, thank you all for the discussion. I'm so happy I resolved my uh, volume and speaker issues. I would have missed the whole meeting. Um, let's turn some time over to Mr. Ben Fisher, who will now talk about the EMS by the numbers update. Ben, uh, can you go ahead and share your screen or turn your monitor on? Yep. Um, there we go. Uh, yeah, so um, some of you may remember that uh, last year uh, we uh, paused the EMS by the numbers report that was uh, provided during the pandemic. 
Um, we have resumed that report now and from our main web page, if you scroll down to latest news each Monday when we uh, provide it, it will be posted here. There's a link here that will take you to the report page um, and then a PDF version of the report will be available uh, every Monday. The measures have remained the same. Uh, we continue to update them um, for the current year and you'll see that they um, contain the same measures that were of interest uh, through the pandemic. Some of our stakeholders requested we resume this report, and so we have. Um, if you have any questions about the report or uh, any of the information in it, please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, we're happy to answer any questions you may have about it. Um, and for the time being, it will continue until uh, we determine it's no longer needed. Um, I will pause there and uh, see if anyone has any questions about that currently, or you can type them into the chat or raise your hand and we'll see if we can take you uh, off mute. All right, well, that was pretty quick. Uh, Monet, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you so much. Let's get back to this agenda. Josh Legler, we have you next. And we have that you're going to discuss the interoperability update. And I now turn the time over to you. OK, thanks, Monet. Give me a second to share just a few things on my screen here. Um, I have a few things I'd like to cover with everyone on uh, EMS interoperability. Uh, first, I want to point out uh, that there's a new page on the NEMSIS website uh, that covers our interoperability efforts. Uh, you can get to that page through the US Using EMS Data menu, and it's down at the bottom of that menu. Um, it's got an announcement about the data summit. It's got information about the task force uh, and some additional information uh, about interoperability. So this is a good kind of launching point if you uh, are kind of wondering where to start to uh, track what we're doing with interoperability. I just recommend uh, starting on this page here and then following the links uh, that it sends you to. Um, I also want to uh, talk a little bit about the Interoperability Task Force, the EMS Data Summit coming up in December, and then increasing outcome data in the national database. Uh, the EMS Interoperability Task Force, uh, the next meeting is tomorrow. It uses the same link as this call. Um, I've been reviewing the uh, attendance from the past few task force calls, and we've had six to seven vendors, uh, EMS vendors, uh, represented on those calls over the last few months. Um, I want to emphasize that the the primary uh, purpose for the EMS Interoperability Task Force is to assist uh, EMS software vendors in your ability to develop uh, interoperability solutions for your customers. So it's really meant for you vendors. We have a variety of people on the call, and they all help to uh, provide viewpoints uh, and perspectives. Um, but ultimately, that is going to feed into EMS software vendors at some point writing software code that makes your systems become interoperable. And in order to write that software code, you need to know what clinicians need in the interoperability workflow and what standards you need to implement so that you can come uh, interact with other healthcare data systems using the standards they use. So uh, if you are a software vendor and your company has not been participating in these calls, I would really uh, strongly invite you to uh, begin participating in the EMS Interoperability Task Force. Um, my kind of forward-looking prediction is that all software and hardware that's related to healthcare um, needs to become interoperable. And that's not just EMS, it's across the whole healthcare ecosystem, uh, that those uh, software products and hardware devices need to be able to communicate with each other back and forth. Um, and so this is our effort to help software vendors to have the tools that you'll need uh, so that you can build interoperability. Um, I wanna see this be something that every software vendor that's Nemesis compliant has the tools to do and can come with a level playing field and be able to offer interoperability to their customers. So tomorrow's uh, task force topic is uh, the patient identification phase of the interoperability workflow. So how, do, uh, how does a software product help um, an, an EMS user to identify the patient that they're about to treat 
um, so that they can look them up in a health information network and get their medical history. Um, so that's what we'll be talking about tomorrow, along with a couple other topics. Uh, and then looking forward to um, next year, uh, we will not have the task force call in December because of the EMS data summit. So we'll pick it back up in January. And in the first few months of next year, the task force is going to be focusing on the question of what data elements, what information is of interest to clinicians in the interoperability workflow. So for example, when uh, EMS um, tries to find the medical history of a patient that they're trying to treat, what medical history does EMS need that will help them treat the patient You know, among all the potential medical history information that's potentially available? Uh, in order to answer that topic, we need to make sure that we have people who uh, represent that clinician perspective. So uh, if you can help with those topics or you know people who can help with those topics, I would love for you to get in touch with me. Uh, you can just uh, send me an email. Um, uh, by the way, that's josh at joshualegler.com. I can put that in the chat when we're done. Um, and, and so I want to make sure that we uh, have some good perspectives as we jump into that topic over the next few calls, uh, the beginning of next year, and really understand what EMS needs, what the people in the hospital need uh, when they uh, are sharing data with each other. Uh, to track what the task force is doing, to join the Google group, you can go to uh, Google Groups and look for the EMS task force. Or if you go to that interoperability page on the NEMSIS website, uh, you can follow the link, uh, link to the task force from there. So that's a task force. And by the way, I forgot to monitor chat. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to put them in the chat or raise your hands. Um, next, uh, the EMS Data Summit. Uh, we've mentioned this a couple of times. It's coming up on December 15th uh, in the afternoon. This will be uh, in person in Washington, DC, or uh, online. Uh, you can attend either way, uh, picking up with lessons learned from the 2020 EMS Data Summit. And uh, again, around this topic of uh, what are the next things we need to do to make it possible for EMS to have data interoperability with the rest of healthcare, uh, health, informa health information exchanges and hospitals. Uh, I'm Pleased to say we have about 80 people registered to attend in person and another 80 people uh, currently registered to attend online. So uh, it's looking uh, fantastic as far as participation. Uh, there's no cost to register for the data summit. Uh, so you can click this or snap this QR code or uh, we'll put the uh, link in the chat um, to sign up for the summit. Or again, go to the interoperability page on the NEMSIS website. We've got a banner right at the top about the summit. Um, I wanted to let you know, uh, we are hoping to find one more EMS agency to present at the summit. We have one lined up so far. Uh, we're trying to find an EMS agency that has interoperability in place and who can uh, speak to the benefits that that has brought for them, for their patients, for the hospitals they work with, um, how interoperability has helped. Um, if you uh, work for an agency that has interoperability in place, uh, and have something you could share, or if you know of an agency that uh, has some some great stuff going on, um, then I would invite you to uh, email me, and uh, we'll see if we can get connected with that agency and and potentially have them participate in this summit. All right, and then the last topic I have: uh, increasing outcome data in the national EMS database. Um, I have a new deliverable in my uh, Nemesis contract that uh, that I just started on to help um, EMS agencies, states, and vendors with increasing uh, their the percentage of their patient care reports that have hospital outcome data in them at, that come to the national database. So what we're finding uh, as we work on this is uh, there are many cases where an agency has interoperability in place and they're getting some information about their patients' outcomes from the hospital. But when we look in the national database, that outcome data is not uh, included in the patient care report. And there's various barriers for that. One is that the information may be getting back to the agency but it's not truly uh, an integrated solution where it's getting into their data system and can be embedded in uh, the NEMSIS XML export that goes to the state. Uh, another 
barrier we see is that uh, the agency sends their record to the state right after the call is finished. They get the outcome data a few days later, and they never resend the Nemesis XML record to the state. Um, so even though the agency got the outcome data, it never made it to the state database and therefore not up to national. Uh, there's probably some other barriers in place uh, as well. Um, so what we're looking for here is really to get some of that low-hanging fruit where we know that some, some integrations are in place. And with just a, a few steps, we could probably get that outcome data all the way into the national database. Um, so I am available to help. Uh, whether you're in a state EMS office, you represent an EMS agency, or you're working for an EMS software vendor, uh, any of you can contact me uh, to get some specific help on your situation uh, to increase outcomes in the national database. Um, Jay Osby from Wyoming, I saw your email from this morning, uh, and that's uh, perfectly in line with uh, what I'm trying to do here with these efforts. So um, I'll be happy to talk with you for sure. Uh, and we'll see what we can do to, to just get some of those uh, small barriers out of the way and increase outcomes in the database. All right, so that's uh, the end of my update. And um, I don't see any further stuff in the chat or raised hands. So um, I think that'll be a wrap. Actually, Thank Josh. Thank you so much, Josh. Oh, sorry, hey. Mr. Cheney. Hey, Monday. how are you? I'm sorry. Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. I'm sorry, day after 12. So I uh, just want to say, you know, in terms of this uh, EMS data summit in December, if you can't participate in person, and I completely understand why a lot of people can't, um, please try to participate online. It is very important that the leadership of the Office of the National Coordinator and other federal agencies that will be there see your interest and your participation. The goal in this for me is to come out of this meeting with the steps forward for us to work with ONC to do everything we can to make sure that EMS is da data is included in every initiative that they have and make sure that they realize the extent to which this is so much easier for them to work with the pre-hospital environment than the hospital environment, given the standardization and really the cohesiveness by which you all work. So I, I can't emphasize that enough. Um, in terms of federal government, if for those of you, you know, I know you all work at the state government, it's, it's even amplified at the federal government level. If you want to kill a project, there's a couple of ways to do it. One is obviously don't fund it. The other way is to just don't show interest, um, have a meeting, bring people together, and no one shows up. Leadership looks at that and says, wow, um, I guess it wasn't that big a deal after all. The louder your voices are at this opportunity, um, the more likely that we see EMS data included in all of their efforts moving forward. I, I just I, I can't emphasize that enough. And some of you are very vocal and participate on a lot of committees, even outside of the EMS world. And that is spectacular. Um, but we need to get more of you doing the same thing. There's no cost to it. Um, you can do it virtually. So there's really no reason other than it really isn't the greatest time of year to have a meeting like this, but uh, I didn't pick it. So um, please participate if you can, if you have, if you can, you have questions. And as Josh says, we're still looking for someone else um, to present uh, or a, one other agency. So if you know someone who would be a great example, um, please let us know. That's huge. Thank you all. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Cheney. You actually have the next two topics, and the first would be the V35 evaluation slash update. Oh, yes, ma'am. Thanks, Monet. And uh, so basically, we have this on the agenda because I committed about a month ago to just every part of every month looking to see where we are. We're, um, you know, two months out from the end of the year. We still have quite a few states and many agencies that have to transition to version 3.5. Uh, we still have no plans of moving any dates. Um, we're working with Dia and the SEMSO on a routine basis 
talking with them about where we are. I keep her up to date um, every time somebody goes green. So um, basically, I want to make sure that, uh, you know, you know, we're paying attention to this. I still have I've had one state um, come to me and say, hey, look, you know, we're not going to make that date. We've got it. We've got a plan. Um, outside of that, I have not had um, any others come and say, hey, look, you know, we're, we're struggling. I think there's a lot of agencies that are playing catch up. And really, I believe it's just the expansion of the workforce issue. I think most of you heard me say this before. Um, you know, the workforce issue in EMS is not limited to just clinicians in the field. It's the leadership. It's certainly the data managers. I mean, we see turnover in the data managers. We turn over to state directors. We see turnover in the leadership within the agencies themselves. So um, I'm, I'm not shocked, but I just wanted everyone to know that we're, we are committed to keeping an eye on this as we move forward in, in the next two months. And I'm sorry, Monet, the next topic was? Yes. If you have any additional items from the Office of EMS or anything related to NHTSA, yeah, absolutely. Um, the biggest one for me is, I, you know, I got to attend several of the regional meetings this year, which we have not done in the past as an office in NHTSA. And I will tell you that we will be doing everything we can do to attend those in the future. Um, I've always wanted to. We, we're working with uh, Dia and the leadership at the SEMSO to make sure we can. Um, these are excellent opportunities for me to get a better understanding of not only what you're doing, but how you're getting funded. And we've been talking a lot about the trauma registries in our office and how they fit into the highway safety funds and funding, trying to make the, not trying to, but outlining the case for um, these things are expensive. They are necessary in some cases for uh, collecting traumatic injury data for um, motor vehicle crash victims and outcome data. So, um, that's one thing that I've learned out of that. The other thing that I've learned is that many of these data systems, and I use that as terms of everything that somebody would collect at the state level, um, whether it's uh, CARES, whether it's one of the stroke registries, the trauma registries or whatever, are just cobbled together with the grant money to keep them alive, which is uh, unacceptable. So we're putting together sort of an overall kind of summary of you know data in general and EMS and what should be in there and what should be funded. I, I guess um, the registry thing for me, and this is a personal opinion, um, so I'll, I'll make that clear. I, I get registries, but they bother me in that everybody wants to create their own little world and then wants everyone to fund that particular registry. Uh, when a lot of that data and all that exists in existing systems, whether that's an MSIS or a hospital system or something else. So I, I it, it, it's interesting how this registry thing has kind of taken off and there's additional efforts for other registries going on at the federal level. Um, it's a little concerning because they tend to, to draw a lot of initial funding and then everybody at your level and other levels are trying to meet their needs and it just puts more more labor on trying to segment data and more cost in trying to do it. And then when you want data back from those registries, people are asking you to pay for it, which to me is just absolutely ridiculous and not acceptable. So we're uh, addressing some of that as well. But I'll stop there and say, if any of you have any comments, questions or concerns for me, please let me know. Um, otherwise, um, Thank you, and uh, be safe over the holiday season coming. Yes, Mr. Cheney, there is a um, question for Mr. Fight. He has his hand up. Would you like to take that question? Sure, Jonathan. Can someone Jonathan, you're uh, still allow... on Or Chris, unmute Jonathan. And we also have a comment from... Uh, let's see who is that. Amber from uh, Colorado. Could could we use the nets of funding to pay for those registry fees? So, um, the answer, Amber, is if it's traffic crash related, yes. If it's cares, no. Um, that's the way DOT is going to look at it. So the question is, 
the question I have in terms of NL Single Out Cares, um, you know, these are great folks doing great work. I get it. But we do a lot of work on the back end with them, Josh, NHTSA, NHTSA Nemesis, and others to make sure they get um, they get the data that they want in the format consistent with CARES. We don't charge them for that. So I kind of feel like we shouldn't get charged when we want the data back. Not kind of, I just feel that way. It's just something I have to sit down with their leadership and talk about at a national level. But this is to me something where, again, if ONC is involved and CARES data is a part of the US CDI and it's required to be accepted into the hospital data sets, then it has to be given back. Otherwise it's information blocking. So it's it's all a part of this learning process as these new registries occur. Um, certainly things like Coverdale, I haven't seen that in some of the stroke registry things, but you have federal developed versus non-federal developed. If it's federally funded, then you have to make it available at a certain level. Um, there's all sorts of, of rules that play in here. So yes, Amber, the, the, the short of the long is like the trauma registries. I think that should be fair game for the 402 and 405 funds. Um, safe streets for all, even um, some of those. Jonathan, are you, whenever you're ready. Hey there. Thanks, sir. Um, so I certainly appreciate it. I, I think I just wanted to shed a, a, a beacon of hope and light uh, in light of a, a point that you just made. And I see that several friends are on this call. Uh, so some of this work has been going on for a long time. But when you you mentioned a few minutes ago about the idea of sort of every every system for itself, um, and I, I don't think it's premature because it was a publicly uh, engaged thing to mention that uh, with our friends at ESO, for example, uh, just a couple weeks ago, we affected a bona fide interoperability initiative with the Michigan Health Information Network. Uh, so essentially, an EMS agency and a hospital both came together. Um, that was the Reading Emergency Unit uh, and Hillsdale Hospital. Uh, Reading Emergency uses ESO. Uh, Hillsdale wanted to receive data from MyHIN, the, the state health, health information network. Um, and uh, ESO took, a, took a, a minute to sort of get all the all the papers signed, so to speak, and kind of get the ducks in the row. Uh, but the data are flowing through, uh, and they have been, as of last week, consumed as uh, um, or confirmed as receivable and consumable by Michigan Health Information Network. Um, this is not the first time this type of thing has happened, but it is extremely visible because MyHIN is so big. Uh, it is a statewide HIE. Uh, so I, I do want to give you something to uh, take heart about. Hopefully we'll have a, a few more of these to talk about at the conference coming up in uh, December, the uh, the summit. Uh, but organizations are working together. Um, where I think there is an ongoing challenge, and you're, we're, this is a perfect example of where of, of a, a good setting for this, uh, is there's a lot of noise in this market, right? It can be very hard uh, to, to get, even when positive things happen, to get the word out and have them just not get lost in the noise. <laughs> So to the degree that there is an opportunity to do a drumbeat, and I've, I've been taking notes on my side uh, about organizations in Colorado, California, Texas, uh, that can talk about interoperability initiatives that are working, um, that are at scale. But but this is something that I think where you are concerned about every man for themselves, so to speak, um, that is changing pretty aggressively. Um, California, incidentally, because we always do everything right in California, let the rest of you know that. Um, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I feel the same way. Um, but California is actually leading on some of this in a really interesting way. And it's worth looking at. There's a number of uh, again, vendors here who work in California. I see John Pringle and uh, others that um, the data exchange framework at the state level is facilitating the type of bi-directional feed requirement that you just mentioned. Uh, it's not optional. Um, it's something I'll be talking about next week at the California Fire Chiefs Association meeting in the North, um, where there are regulations in place that say, if you are a participating EMS or fire service, and you participate in the state DXF under Assembly Bill uh, 133, that you are required to be given back the information that you are submitting, essentially, that, and that is available in USCDI. So to the degree that, and again, for anyone who doesn't know USCDI, that is the uh, US core data. I always forget what the I stands for, but Josh can remind me. Um, and, and the point is, this is sort of the, the nationalized data set. And if you are submitting data in alliance with that, which you would be 
if you are going inbound, uh, then you can get the data outbound. Uh, and there's not an option anymore to, to, you know, choose or not to choose to participate. EMS and fire are still voluntary to that process, but they're being encouraged to participate. And the rest of the healthcare system is non-optional in California. It presents a very strong template for how others could proceed. And that's the key, Jonathan. So that's why I said it's so critical to have everybody at ONC meeting, because that's where all of this comes together. And you're right. There are a lot of core groups. And I've been going back to 2020, reviewing the things that we took out of the first data summit that we did. And in that time, we brought people in the room that we didn't even know existed. There were people there that just didn't know one another, organizations that didn't know they existed. But I referred to in that meeting continuously, islands of success. And the key is, is that we don't expend resources, people, and time rebuilding the same thing over and over in different places. And the key to that is is working through ONC. So thanks for that. And I know that, uh, um, Monet, you know, uh, if there's anything else that anyone needs from me, uh, please let me know. Otherwise, Jonathan, I I look forward to meeting you at, uh, at your meeting in Texas coming up. Thank you so much, Mr. Cheney, and also thank you, uh, Mr. Jonathan Fight, for your comment. Um, let me go ahead and share this uh, agenda. Okay. Uh, are there any additional topics for open forum? Anyone want to raise their hand and bring up any topics of interest at this time? Okay. You can also put your information in the chat. Okay, I would like to mention that our next meeting, okay, we have Amber. Amber, uh, can someone allow Amber to come off mute? Ooh, I have the power. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, Since we did briefly talk about uh, CARES a little bit, just um, putting out there for folks that are CARES states, um, just curious who might be sending data from their state repository to um, the CARES team. If anyone is doing that yet, I would love to hear from you, or if you're working towards that objective, uh, I wonder if we could get a few of us together to compare notes. Thank you so much, Amber. Uh, If there are any states that are currently participating with CARES, would you add your information to the chat? And we will review the chat information and provide that to Amber. Or you can reach her directly. Okay, in the interest of time, I'm going to uh, talk about our next upcoming meeting, which is scheduled for actually, we will not have a meeting on November the 22nd um, in honor of the Thanksgiving holiday week and give you all some time to celebrate with your families. So our next meeting will be scheduled for December the 13th. Now, typically in December, we um, have postponed our public training. If there are topics of interest, that you would like to see a training on, would you please add that information to the chat or send me an information, send me your information in a an email or in a ticket. I am currently preparing the 2024 public training uh, calendar. I'm looking for topics of interest as well as folks who might be interested in helping to make a presentation, but more specifically, uh, if there's information that you're needing from the NEMSIS TAC, a, a specific training that we could conduct for 30 minutes to an hour where we can answer your questions, please let us know. We're very um, committed to continuing the public training uh, schedule. And if there are no additional topics, um, I am going to thank you so much for your participation today. We know how extremely busy you are, and we appreciate the time that you take with us um, to participate on the calls. Thank you again, and I hope everyone has a fantastic holiday, um, and we'll see you in December.